everyone, and welcome to Into the Absurd, a virtually existential dinner conversation. I'm Erica Holscher, Artistic Associate Artistic Director of the Idiopathic Ridiculopathy Consortium. Welcome. I have a few housekeeping details before we commence. This conversation will be recorded. And in order to keep the conversation flowing, please mute your audio and video and hide all non-video participants. You can be, this can be accomplished by clicking the up arrow next to the video camera on the lower left corner of your screen and selecting video settings. The fourth box down under the meeting section says hide non-video participants. If you click that box, then you will have the same view as we have during the recording. <coughs> While you're pondering these existential musings, please chime in using the chat function if you have questions or comments as we bring good nothingness to life. And now, Tina Brock, producing artistic director and founding member of the IRC. Hi everybody, again, I'm Tina Brock and welcome to a virtually existential dinner party here where a dinner conversation where every week at five o'clock on Saturday, we're going to pull together some of our favorite friends and associates, people that are working in creative fields, people that are in education and just bring them to the table. And as Erica said, bring good nothingness to life. I think this is, if ever there was a time for us to consider our existential Quandaries, it is a world on fire. And I think the question of making art during this time, how we make art during this time, and how we bring each other together through this time is so very important. So while we can't do it on the stage, we certainly can do it in conversation. And we invite you every week to join the party, well, join the conversation, and to put your questions in the chat box. Each week we'll go for 45 minutes about and we'll bring some of our favorite people, as I said, into the show. Now, normally we have Greg Day here, who is um, a friend of the IRC and a person who has been so instrumental throughout the years in activism. He lives in uh, Austin, Texas right now. He used to be in Philadelphia, a proud St. Joe's grad. He is out organizing a Black Lives Matter um, uh, march today, so he won't be with us, but you'll find him here next week. So tune in for that. But I do want to welcome to the table today, Rob Hutter, who is an actor, a producer, a friend, an all-around Renaissance guy who I met a long, long time ago when he worked for the IRC. He is just um, a, a terrific, terrific person. And I want you to, to get to see Rob in all of his glory because he's a multi-dimensional, super thoughtful person. And Rob and I caught up recently, just as a little bit of background, when he went out on Facebook because he is starting a new venture as a life coach. And so he was looking for folks to test on, I guess is the proper word to sort of work that out with. And so I jumped into the fray and I have had such an enormously rewarding experience working with him. And I think that that question is really important and valid for right now and here's why. Because most of the people that I talk to are rethinking their lives, they're thinking about their artistic work in relation to what's happening in the world. And so many people are jumping careers or looking inward and I think a discussion about life coaching and existentialism is, is something I was very interested in. And so, Rob Hutter, thank you for being on a virtually existential dinner conversation. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, Tina. And hello to everyone in the audience. It's great to be here. You know, so Rob, one thing, uh, we talked the other day, and I know Rob from his work on the stage, but also some work that you've done that's super important to what happens in the community is this work at, at, at senior centers and assisted living, which I just think is one of the most fabulous ways to keep seniors active and get their brains working. But obviously, like so many people, you've had to adjust, I mean, your whole thinking about that business. And... I want to know, is that what led to seniors? I mean, is that what led to your looking into life coaching or was that, uh, that a project that had been going on before COVID came? So I had, um, I had received life coaching Tina when I oh, 20 years ago when I was going through a transitional period. And uh, I was introduced at that time to uh, 
a typology personality test called the Enneagram. And uh, uh, it was extremely useful for me in attaining self-awareness and empathy for others. And anyways, it's a, it's a very cool assessment tool. And it allowed me to kind of go in a little bit deeper and get to know who I am and why, why I make the choices that I make. So I went to an Enneagram workshop in January. It was extremely deep experience. And I learned about the nine different personality types and where I fit in and how to type other people, et cetera, et cetera. And I came back from the experience. It was just at the start, just before the pandemic. And I went, wow, um, this is incredible. Uh, there are many aspects of my work that I'm kind of dissatisfied with. And I would like to, I knew, I knew unconsciously when I went to this deep retreat that something was shifting in my life and something had to shift. So when I got back, I said, uh, a lot of the people I was studying with were therapists or coaches. And I said, well, do I want to coach or do I want to be coached? And then I realized that I really wanted both of them. And then uh, I started researching coaching institutes and the pandemic hit. So my, and my business went like March the 9th, it was over. And, um, you know, because of that uh, uh, demographic, the older adults, everything shut down immediately after the Kirkland House reported in Washington and Oregon, all the deaths. And um, so I had uh, 30 entertainers that I was booking. I had my own one man show that I was booking and performing, uh, lots of classes for senior adults. And overnight, I just kind of lost it all, went through this like, holy crap, what the hell do I do with my life right now? Um, but I was also on the road to this coaching piece and uh, pivoted fast. Um, I went, you know, at first we didn't know how long we were gonna be shut, shut in, shuttered. Hutter was shuttered, yes. And then I, uh, within two weeks, I registered for uh, uh, a school called Coachville and a school for conscious living to deepen my studies. And uh, so here I am. Um, and it's funny, I was just thinking earlier, like, you know, what, 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 is, what is the message that I really wanna share here today? And that is, what a glorious time to be alive. I don't know if I'm projecting that onto the world, but it's certainly my experience right now is that I have so much spaciousness in my life that I haven't had for years. And, um, and it just feels really good. Um, yeah, I, think I don't want the pandemic to go on, but my gosh, I would love this. This, as I were to use spaciousness, I want, I want this to continue. And it's going to because of the choice I made to shift careers. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think there's certainly a revolt going on both literally and also internally. And that's, that's sort of the questions that I'm really, really fascinated by is the fact that it is time, you know, the cracks in our society are really starting to show with everything that's happening and people's voices are being heard, whether it's your internal voice or the voice you're expressing externally. And I think in considering, I'll be very interested to talk to you about how many people, how much of a, a flow you're seeing into your business, because I think people are really looking very deeply to ask themselves the questions of how does my creativity fit with what is happening in the world today? How do I express, how, how do I be creative in a world where there's so much anxiety that it's, it, it sometimes can be difficult? Because I think we, we create in context, right? And if the context is a world on fire, then, then it, you know, it, it, like a big question I had coming into today, and, and I'm off on a little bit of a tangent now, but that is, do we create, do we create, do we expand when things are a little bit less on fire? Or, you know, do, do we need a sense of security in order, in order to really expand and in order, order to follow our path? I think what I'm saying, like that external creativity, is one aspect of it. Internally, I think it's a whole other story and I think people are doing that work and I'd be interested to know if you're well, saying that. Can I, I, there's something I just wanna, I really wanna address because you said on fire and it's sort of like the, what is it, the white elephant in the room? But it's the black elephant. I had the experience last night of, um, I had uh, here is the, uh, uh, a happy hour on the roof deck of my apartment and we called it homo, happy hour and we invited some of the gay men who live here in the building and I invited a friend of mine to come over and I, I just want to share this experience because because it well 
I'll probably be clear why I want to share it after I share it. And that is that, so here we were last night, I brought my friend over, his name, uh, and we were just, we were drinking and just making small talk, and uh, it was small talk, and I was just like, I want to say, hey guys, there's shit to talk about. And one of the members, so the friend that I invited over is African American. Okay, so here we are, all of us white guys, and we're talking about what's going on in Minneapolis and all over the place. And then one of the guys turned to my friend, and it was like, you know, the scariest thing or the hardest thing for people to do is to talk about what's actually going on in the here and now in a group. And he turned to him and he said, you know what? I don't know what the fuck to do as a white man, as a white person. Please tell me what to do. And it was such, uh, like it was, it was like, uh oh, it was just, it was a moment. It was, you know, you want to call it great theater. It was great life. It was, you know, my, it was like my friend was seen at that moment. And, so, so let me ask you, Rob, what did he mean, I don't know what to do? What do you think he meant by that? Well, he, you know, he said, here we are, we, we hide behind our white privilege, and we're watching right now what's going on, and, like, we don't know what to do. I mean, do we, do we go on Facebook and be the seventh million person to share uh, the video that's streaming all the time about the, you know, the, the black... Uh, man being killed or you know so do you think he was worried about appropriating is that I mean do you think that was part of that's part of the concern or part of the conversation like if I do that am I appropriating somebody else's experience and I don't have that experience so I can't I'm, I'm, I'm wondering I mean it's a very fair question what he's saying and you hear people say it all the time but I think what's really interesting is do you, what do, do you do you hear people say it all the time though uh, I yes, hear please. a bunch of white people say it to a bunch of white people Yes. That's what I hear said. Yes. And, okay. you know, uh, I, um, so, so I, what's interesting to me is, is it really that you don't know what to do or is it you're afraid you're going to be wrong? You know what I mean? Which are all, all very valid, but I think the instinct is, right, you, you would help. You would want to help or be a part of that. So is it, because I think this is part of the conversation. Are we afraid that the thing we do is going to look like we're, trying to seem as though we understand something that we probably clearly don't. I, I'm just, I'm wondering if that's, so how did the conversation go? What was the answer? What did he say? Let's say, um, do you remember? I mean, not that yeah, you no, can remember, I, I, but. Uh, well, it was, I was so uh, uh, overwhelmed by the moment. Beck, uh, my friend is, was very quiet, uh, quiet, very nice demeanor. And he said, we, need to be listened to. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, no, he go ahead. No, so Robin, Robin, has a, Robin has a thought here, which I think is, is, is one that I'm seeing again and again and again and again on Facebook is, and this is Robin's, Robin's, um, oh, and I see this is to me privately, Robin, so if that were the case, I'm not sure if I should be asking this or not, but I think you're probably going to be okay with it. Um, what I hear, and what I hear as well, is that Black people don't want to be asked that question because it's work, that, it's work that they shouldn't have to do. That's right. That's you know, right. it's work, it's like, and, and then, so then the question comes in, the question is coming in, but it's not changing. It's not changing. And that is a question they kept asking this morning on MSNBC of the guests is like, to all the experts is like, we've been having this conversation and yet this is still happening. So how do we get beyond well, that? Well, because, all right, so uh, Robin, 100% what you're saying, um, it, it's like I, I speak to so many people of color who just go, you know what, I, I just, I, I am so, I do not want to be educating white people. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry, what did you just ask, Tina? Well, no, I'm, I'm wondering, like the root of my question a couple minutes ago was just like, is there some, and this goes back to the coaching, Rob, where you were working with me, this show was born out of that coaching, where you were okay. working with me to find the sense of play that I had as a child, as a teenager, as a whatever, as a whatever, and which I had when I formed the IRC, and which slowly kind of dissipated because all these other considerations came on board. Mm -hmm. So, when you link that to instinct, what is our instinctual thing that we would do? Like what, you know, like I fear that we, that we do lose 
that instinct, whatever it is, because that's generally the right thing to do, right? Whether yep. it's uh, whether it's reach out to a friend of mine who has posted on Facebook, um, you know, and it, do I just like that post or I just say I'm with you or I hear you or whatever. I, well, I, so, excuse me for, for interrupting, Tina. We we need to be doing what 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 my friend, my white friend, did is ask provocative questions. What you're doing right now, what I do as a coach, we need to we need to like say directly to people, what can we do? See, I don't, that doesn't happen. So my friend contacted me this morning and he said, Rob, when's the next homo happy hour? I want to be there. So this is one black man with five white, with, with five white men. That's quite unusual. Usually the experience, from my experience, is that he would feel very isolated, very not listened to, not, you know, not following the jargon, et cetera, et cetera. But those, you know, specifically white people saying, and saying to black people, what can I do? What do I need to hear? Who, I, who am I supposed, who, okay, so I've inherited all the shit from ancestors and stuff, and I've learned to hate because my three-year-old self did not hate black people or, or Asian people. What, what do I need to, what do I need to do? Be, who do I need to be? What does your instinct think? I mean, and that is precisely, you know, it's funny, you know, it's precisely what we're going through right now in, in our culture is who am I, right? I mean, we are asking right, you know, right. the existential questions of who am I? What have I got to contribute? How can I, yes, I, I mean, what's the meaning of my life up until now? Yeah, I do think, I mean, in most of the conversations I've had, you know, 200 people where I work were, were laid off at the beginning of the week and they were laid off for good reason because you cannot, you cannot do the work that I was doing in the way that it, we were to do it. And, and so that's perfectly understandable, but it does give you, uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a time to be revolutionary, both outside yourself and inside yourself, as we look at what are the ways in which I can contribute, art can contribute, what does this company, you know, five years ago, people would say to me when, when we were in a much better, well, I don't know if we were in a much better time and place, we were in a different time and place, and people would say, you know, 45 got voted in and then people were like, oh, whoa, you know, what, what does absurdism have to say about this? And I'm like, absurdism has nothing to say about this because this is more absurd than anything I could possibly ever say on the stage. Now I feel like we're coming into a time with, with just straight ahead, the questions Beckett was asking, Ionesco was asking straight ahead, what does it mean to be alive on this earth today? And what do I have to say about that? And I think, you know, right now it's so on, I keep using the word on fire, but it does feel like that's what's happening. And for me, it's, 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 a, it's a time of change that doesn't involve a lot of artistic clarity for me anyway. Well, you know, it's funny as you were just speaking, I thought to myself, uh, right now, um, so right now we are living in an Ionesco play. Though I mean, the, the world is living in it right now. Or, so or let's say we've always been living in it and the world is, exist is an existential play. But right now, hopefully, hopefully this, pa this pandemic is saying, wake the fuck up, people, wake up. And that's what I think your theater work does. It's like, this is, and, and we're all saying, we're asking the existential questions. So where I'm, where I'm going at right now with this is how big, and I know like, would there be a bigger audience for, you know, theater, absurdist theater, existential sure. theater? Well, I don't right. know. I mean, it's a great question, Rob. I do think that what, um, it feels a little bit, uh, while I appreciate certainly Ionesco was dealing with the sort of lighter, not lighter, the very deep questions, but he did it in a, you know, circus and clowning were much more a part of his work. This takes me to the Eastern, Eastern European absurdist, Arabal, you know, battle, you know, picnic on a battlefield. I mean, these are like, I'd always stayed away from some of the Eastern Europeans because I felt for the last 10 years, they were just so in war, I mean, so violent, you know, and, and I thought, oh Lord, we're not in that place right now. This feels, and now it feels so absolutely very right to be looking at those very, those mid 20th century, um, you know, who are coming out of the war. And, and so I think, it, you know, this time is a much different time, but I think it's a good a point you make. 
What, what will audience, you know, I had someone call today to say, hey, is your June show on? And I was like, you know, lovely, lovely, lovely guy, you know, what and show? I was like, the what June show? show, he was asking if the June show was on, oh. and we canceled the June and, and fall show, and I was like, no, 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 we, the, the Walnut's not open yet, and we're not going to be, and he wasn't, you know, he was just, you know, and he, but it got me thinking, because I really, I don't, it's so hard to create and think about art, for me anyway, in a time when you do not have artistic context. Like, it's almost like the context hasn't been birthed yet because the event is happening. It's like, you don't know what your child looks like because you're in labor, is what it feels like to me right yes, now, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Um, Absolutely. But, but let's, let's, just, let's go off a little, I wanna go back a little bit, Rob, and, and, and talk to you about what your, let me just, are people coming to you now? Did, like, in other words, when you put that call out for people who wanted to be coached, did you get a lot of people? Are people really struggling? It's, it's, an, it's that's a good question. So in my uh, coaching class, we share, you know, it is, uh, with the class, what's going on this with is our your, coaching. You, that's is you and other coaches. So I'm, I, when you yes, say your coaching yes, class. So, uh, coaching right. so I'm studying at Coachville. And so we have a chance to share um, what's going on. And a lot of people said in, in the past, they put out a lot of posts on Facebook and they get so many people responding, wow, this sounds great, I'd love to do it. And they don't get people to, they don't get people to enroll. And they're offering free coaching. However, I put it out, I got five people, the first post, and to, to, to say, hey, this sounds great. And all five of them have, uh, uh, have enrolled with me and I'm coaching. Mm -hmm. And Do you think they're afraid? What happens that would make them make that initial oh, that initial oh. jump and then decide they get a little afraid or what? what oh, well, I'm, I'm working with a woman who, okay, I'm working with a woman who is an incredibly successful Canadian actress. Uh, we were in acting school together back in the early 80s, just got appointed as artistic director of, uh, of a theater in Quebec. And, you know, they got her the apartment, everything was rolling, and then this happened. And she had just was about to start a, a new job. And over the course of a couple of months of the last few months, she, she fell apart. She just unraveled. So I was talking about the Enneagram earlier on. It's proven, so when I'm working with my, my, my players or my coaches, my clients, we looked at what her Enneagram type is. And her Enneagram type is a type three, is a very achievement oriented person. And that type of person is sometimes really out of touch with their heart. So our work together is about like reconnecting her with what it is that she believes in, who she is, what her feelings are. Um, so that was really substantial for her. And like I said, for some people right now, uh, uh, no, let me take it back. For almost everyone right now, putting one foot in front of the other is like really difficult to do. So people are like, can't seem to access especially now what it is they want to what their big dream in life is until they can get the boxes sorted through the weight lost the 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 exercise thing happening which is really fear based of course they can they, they can't access their they're using those things where am i going with this right it's, so we've got it go it's, it's it's just that Right now is a difficult time for people to access their both their inner knowing and their inner state because they're so freaked out. But right, but, the, but yeah, but right. So don't 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 we think? I think that's tied up a little bit to that question about being creative. Like, what's fate? Like, if the ground is constantly shifting underneath of you, right? The beginning of of this week it was Memorial Day. We come back on Tuesday, and this week, over the course of this week, there has been so many. Some people have called it the worst, you know, one of the worst weeks in American history, just in terms of the things that have unfolded, right? And I think that when the ground is shifting that quickly and it feels as though it's just building, right, it's a stress re response, as Eric is saying, it's a trauma response. So you have, you know, you've got people doing whatever they can just to kind of hold their, hold themselves, hold themselves, literally, you know, and, and that makes perfect sense, right? The eating, all the other stuff we're doing, you're just trying to find a way to hold yourself. I wondered when you said that she just fell apart, those were your words, and I, I understand what you mean by that. But I, I thought about all the other artists who are, who are out in the community whose lives are just intrinsically tied 
to what we do on a day -to -basis, daily day basis. So in addition to not being able to hit the stage every night, their identity as a person is not only just on hold, but it is in such big question because we are asking these enormous questions as to like, what place does art serve in our world right now? We know we need it. You know, you want to watch Andrea Bocelli because like, thank God someone can emit that much beauty. But then you're like, so you, you use it as an island, you use it as an escape or whatever you need to do with it. But I do wonder, you know, I wonder Rob, like, so, so has that affected have you been able to coach her in a way or get get through that? Or do you think the world needs to be in another position before that work could actually get done, knowing that it's individual for each person? I mean, do you think that the magnitude of this is so hard that it's going to be harder to coach people? Or is it just a function of the person? No, I think... I think that it's an important time that I don't want, I don't actually want us to rush through this time right now. Because so let me just say that my fear of what happened, what's going on at the on fire in, in this country right now, I'm afraid in four days from now that fire is going to start going down, going out again. I actually, I, I, I'm- Say it again? I'm sorry, I, I missed the last part. You're afraid I, the fire. I, I'm the fire. I'm afraid the fire is going to go out, right? Like, so we have a school. We have a we have a shooting, a mass shooting at the school or whatever. And then the kids from Florida, they're we're all there about it. And then it dies down again, and the system doesn't change, and the injustices continue. And my concern is that, you know, I I, I don't want us to go back to business as usual. You know, I think you to, think it will die. What's that? What makes you think it will die? It's it's just a worry, or do you do you yeah, feel like I mean, you have isn't, isn't evidence this, of that? Is, but isn't that exactly what? So all the anger that gets stored up comes out when there's when we see something so blatant happening. I mean, this stuff was happening to uh, what's his name, George. Uh, what happened in, in Minneapolis has been happening all the time, and now it's we we now we we're now viewing it on on video cams. On, 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 and, uh, yeah, well, I think we have an election coming up, so that's the good news. Um, and, you know, I think that that's, that's going to be really important. Somehow this feels, at least in my lifetime, to be, because, for the very reason you pointed to, being able to capture this stuff and take it to a larger audience is a really important piece of that. Of that question do you know what i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. having yes. that video as hard as it and as devastating as it is to watch if that doesn't move people into action or to doing something however awkward that might be then then we do have something to worry about so so, you know? so in, in answer to yeah and and like i'm just thinking larry kramer the aids activist just recently died and what what kramer did was he took the aids crisis of the early 80s and he turned it into this phenomenal piece of theater that I recently saw the revival, well, not even recently, maybe seven or eight years ago, Joe Mantello and um, Jim Parsons. It was a revival of the normal heart. And how can we use art as a reflection of what's going on right now? I mean, maybe it means that the, the, we as theater artists or as performing artists, we have to give some thought as to what is, so we're calling it the new normal. So what's the new art that emerges from the new normal? Do we go back to the stuff that we've been doing? Um, yeah, I don't think there's any going, I hope there's no going back. I mean, I would hope that, I think it's gonna be very, very clear in the same way that Zoom is very unrelenting or this new format is very unforgiving in a lot of regards. Um, I mean, we could go on and on about the questions about does theater translate to this form? What can you take away if you're doing a theatrical production or whatever? I mean, there's so many questions about that, which I think are really, really, really interesting. Um, but I, I don't, I, I almost feel like there's not a possibility it can go back. That doesn't mean it's going to go forward. I mean, that doesn't mean that every company is going to find a new way, I think, to say something interesting. I mean, fortunately, I love talking about existential things, and this gets right to the root of that. So, like, you know, I mean, I don't, 
you know, but I think at the heart of any good theater is universal questions that should be asking whether it's Shakespeare or the greatest, you know, you know, playwrights of our time, Annie Baker, Will Eno, like you name it. These people are asking these questions. And so I think it's, it's, it's a question of what is, you know, what, what is your art and how can you say it? And I hate to use this word, but authentically being the struggle that you are saying. There's a question here, Rob, from Rob, a question, Rob, from Robin. She wants to know, um, how does coaching differ from therapy? Yeah, great question. Uh, so therapy, all right, so coaching basically is saying, here's where I am and here's where I want to be. So this is who I am and this is who I want to become. It's really talking to the, the dreams that we hold in life. And it's, it's the movement into the future, as opposed to therapy, which is brings has has us return back into the past to resolve past traumas, to heal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, in in coaching, um, one does act. I mean, a person comes into coaching from their past into the present moment to look at what they want to create in the future. So the traumas they 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 emerge in the context of a coaching session. Mm -hmm. The focus of for my role as a coach is to hold their vision of the future, of what they want to do, of what their dream is, and help walk with them as they move towards it, to co-create it with them. Because well, thanks for co-creating today, by the way, because this whole idea was born out of the coaching session, right? Yeah. So I appreciate you taking that walk with me today. Yeah. By the way, it was you were very successful. In, in a very short amount of time, Rob. Shucks, Tina. Yeah, no, I mean, that was a pretty short amount of time because we were meeting a couple of times a week in order yeah. to do this. So Greg wants to know um, specifically like experiences from your life, uh, your, from your acting um, career that you use in your life coaching. Oh, that's great, okay. So um, <laughs> that's great. So uh, recently I'm coaching a woman who is in, uh, she has a, uh, a, a disorder of physical disability and she's been, she's been shut, shuttered in for the last four years because uh, she cannot, uh, it's, it's, it's a, I don't know what the name of the condition is, uh, it's way too many syllables for me to remember. It's a condition which is, she's affected by chemicals and by smells and by ex exhaust fumes. And um, so she lives in a, in a place, in a room, in a small little flat and she's an incredibly creative woman. And for over the last four years, she's, she's been literally living in darkness. She's been living in depression and because the world's out there. But now that, she's, now that the world has joined her in a, in a similar place, she has an opportunity right now to shine. Mm -hmm. So she's dealing with a lot of demons. Uh, she's also dealing with some, some, uh, she's dealing with some issues around uh, food addiction and uh, uh, dysmorphia. And so what's been happening with her is that she's a musician and she will start talking about the demons that are haunting her when she goes to the refrigerator and she brings in some of the past trauma. And I just said to her very, you know, two sessions ago, I said, all right, now start to sing, go. So mm -hmm. what we did was she was actually composing with me in the moment we were playing. She was playing with lyrics from her pain, from her experience, in the moment, in the coaching. And we, I, you know, I hit the record button fast. I didn't even know how to use this thing, so I just like record. And then uh, end the recording, and we'd be talking more about something. I'd say, okay, wait, go. And, you know, just start, start singing. So, you know, by the end of our session, we had three songs. I said, this is the album, Judy. This is, this is the album that you, um, you need to create. And... So that must so, so, so that was so when I shared this with my coaching school class, it was like wow, um, because the whole philosophy and the theory of my coaching school is that we that we, that life is a game and we got to go out and play, and um, play play a better version of who we are in, into the future. So I guess that answers both uh, hopefully both Robin's question about the the movement, the growth into the future, and Greg how I was able to you know use my, my performing, my, my work as an actor and a director and as an acting coach. Mm -hmm. um, so Rob, me. let me ask you, were the, were the people in Coachville 
Um, why were they wowing? Did because of your ability to bring in theatrical um, yeah. sort of like I mean, what stuff you, to make it? What you learn in every coaching school uh, in the first 60 hours are the basic core proficient coaching proficiencies for certification at the International Coaching Federation. So every coaching school languages the, the, these basic uh, proficiencies in their own kind of jargon. So what was happening is we're learning a script. You know, when I'm coaching you, I'm sort of like pretend, you know, just in, there are moments when my eyes go to glance at my script. And then at a certain point I went, what the fuck? You know, it's like, as much as I do need those competencies and I am learning them, it was just, I need to let my spirit, you know, uh, my spirit mm -hmm. run free as a coach. Mm -hmm. um, so where I, my growth as a coach is going to be taking the tried and true scripts uh, and memorizing those and, and integrating that into who I become. Memorizing a script, but when you get on stage, you got to let it fly. So what, what would... <laughs> What would a bad coach look like, Rob? Is that a person who doesn't have many successes or they're not listening no. very well? Or is there, a, is there a different kind of coach for each person? Right. Or like, right. how do you know if you're not doing it very well? People quit right. on you or like... So coaching, the, 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 uh, yeah, people... They do? They just like give up? Yeah, or they, um, <laughs> or they just don't show up for their appointment. <laughs> but I mean, but what they're dealing with is they're... Okay, so yeah. they're dealing with their fear. Like, uh, why people don't get tasks done is because they're afraid of. They're afraid. People right. Procrastinate mostly out of out of fear. Um, and, the, and the worst thing so, you had to. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. So, so what a, what a coach has to do is really practice non judgmental presence. In other words, so. <laughs> oh my sorry. goodness. Oh, no, I'm just thinking of something. Go ahead. <laughs> What, something from a coaching session we had? Yes. I'm just, no, I'm just thinking that, no, go ahead, finish your thought. But I'm just, no, finish your thought. <laughs> not, not anymore. Well, yeah, because it's just so funny that the one that I am that's just super judgmental of everything, you know, and I'm just coming out with all these judgments, and I'm just wondering in your mind, well, how in the world you got around that, like, how am I going to get her back on track? <laughs> well, and the judgment oh. is back to, to being afraid, making, it has to be perfect. Or it's got to be this way. It's got to be this way. And, you know, you're encouraging me to just, like, be bad. Just be awful at it. Just suck. And just be awful and have everybody laugh at you. And, and like, and how so, important that was. And, 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 how, and, and the, the need to just play with it. Just, just yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. let I'm go sorry. and have fun. I interrupted you, but no, I'm just no, laughing. No, no, no. Because no. when you said judgment, and I was like, I wonder what that guy, he must have been exhausted when he got a lot okay. of questions. So, so, that, so that people, uh, so that all of our fans and your fans know out there in the audience world, Tina is an Enneagram One type. And the, the Enneagram One type is the most critical and self-critical that you can possibly imagine. They, and they generally are beating themselves so hard that they, <laughs> Yeah. So, so T and, and, and judging. Hey, what about the good parts? You left the good parts out. <laughs> the good parts is that they pay attention to detail that they're the ones that you want to have on your team and there's their light bulbs and, uh, Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and visionaries, Tina, yeah. it, it, you're in the same, you're in the same, uh, 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 Enneagram type as Martin Luther King, Mahat, Mahatma Gandhi. And, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there, but, uh, but I'll, but that's good to know that, um, but let me ask you this. What yeah. happens when you get a person and you, and you, so the Enneagram is part of the coaching. It's just no. one tool that you use or you don't necessarily use it. So, so generally there is, it's, it's helpful for a coach to, have, it, not necessary, but I think it's helpful for a coach to have an assessment tools. Some people use a Myers-Briggs, some people use something called DISC, some people use color stuff. Um, I have just really re uh, resonated with, with the Enneagram. Uh, I think it's an incredible psychosocial spiritual tool that doesn't just type you, but it also, it also leads you to your path of growth mm -hmm. into the future. So it's not just so oh, this is what your type is and this is what you're doomed to be and here are your good qualities and here are your bad qualities mm -hmm. and basically this is it, you're fucked. Um, I it, find it like really useful for you to say to me like certain things, you know, like because we all, you know, there's nine of them and we have, they're all clustered in some sort of order and you have, so you, you have versions of the other thing, but for you to say like, you know, you're going towards you're at your healthiest when you're going towards this, you know, a seven, which is the person who is 
so not as judgmental and is more, you know, more, uh, more into play, is more playful. Yeah. Then your best self comes out. So, so, so basically the, the theory is, is that there are three centers of intelligence in our bodies. One is in our head, one is our heart, and one is in our, our gut. And each of our numbers, so there's nine, there's nine Enneagram numbers, three of them are heart types, three of them are head types, and three of them are body types. So, you know, I as a number seven, I'm up in the head a lot. And that's also impacts upon my process as an actor because, and you have worked with me, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I start up here. I start up here and we keep our fingers crossed that by opening night, Rob has moved down to here. So mm -hmm. that's, that's my process. That's, that's mm -hmm. who I am. Other people, yeah. right. And other people, whoom. And, and I, I think, and you are a body. You are, you know, as a type one, Tina, you're a body type. You, right. You, right. You, know, you know day one where the actor has to come from. You know where they have to get to. But you already are coming from that place. So your challenge is to hang tight a little bit and just sort of like nurture the person to get there. I mean, that's, that's the challenge. Right. The one. Well, that, that was super useful to me to, to find that out in the course of this process. That, that like, I mean, it seems kind of an obvious thing that a director should know, but I think exploring it from those different levels of, of was really a lot easier for me. That like, of course, I'm seeing it this way and this is where they need to get. It also has to do with just being impatient and wanting it to happen tomorrow, course, which are right. all things that, but there were other more specific layers in the Enneagram that helped me to understand, oh, right that's this person in not judging them psychologically, like whatever the thing is going on from the psychologically, but more they tend to come from this place. And that's, that's what's coloring there. That's correct. I found it, I found it much more practical in a way than trying to analyze oh, somebody. But, right, you know? no, but what, what I, what, the, so I think there's two goals. One is, is self-awareness, but the second is empathy for others. So I once worked with a, um, with a, uh, a choir director who was a type three, really task-oriented, achievement-oriented, image, image, image. Now, type three is a heart type. Now, when they're out of touch with their heart, they are assholes to work with. So this, this, this uh, choral director was pushing the group and pushing the group and kind of ber not, not berating us for not keeping up, but he was going so fast that the group couldn't follow, or many of us couldn't, and certainly I couldn't. Um, and then what I learned after I did the Enneagram was, wait a minute, he's a type three. He's out of touch with his heart, but he wants to achieve the best. And he wants me to achieve my best. He wants all of us to rise up to this level. So he's not an asshole anymore. He wants me to be, the, to play the best part of who I am, the best version of myself. So I just like lightened up. I just entered the whole experience with the spirit of play because, because I understood, because I typed him and understood that he was out of touch with his heart. He needed this thing to be fucking awesome so he could reconnect to his heart and the audience could connect to their hearts, which is what music does. It's finding just the flow, finding the flow through, yeah. through finding, finding your flow. So Rob, I wanna, um, you've been so gracious to come oh, on today. One other, one other point I wanna make. Oh, please do. I was gonna, I have, I have one final question for oh, you. And if anybody in the audience has questions, or would like to know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Get I'm, him I'm, in there. But go ahead. This is my enthusiastic type seven. I wanted to say that as far as artists are concerned, this is where we get type cast. So when I am playing a character who is an Enneagram seven, I mean, those are the monologues I need to find in order to audition well. I need to find the type seven of monologue um, and it doesn't mean I, and I also want to play a type two, and I also want to play a different, I, I, not am I only the adventurer epicure, which went really well with um, the Marquis de Sade. What was the name of that play I played? The Greg Campbell Show. Yeah, that, that's where I played a type seven character, but it's, um, uh, where the hell was I? Oh, that's also another type seven thing. It's like, I, I just lost track. Basically, yeah, that we're typecast. And uh, what an Enneagram uh, teacher has done is he wrote a book uh, and he's taken movies for the last 75 years. And, he, you know, we can look at a Tom Hanks film where Tom Hanks is playing type three and you can see, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating to watch. You bas so basically, when you're watching a certain type play out their stuff, they're playing out your stuff too. 
and your path of growth. It's just, it's just, it's just, a, just seeing the whole thing on a, on a totally different level. And, and yeah, which, totally like, different level. Well with, yeah. is, is, is kind of what struck me about it. It's a very new way of looking at it. Yeah. Let me just ask you a final question. How will you know if you succeeded? Is as a coach. As a coach. Oh yeah. What do you, what do you feel? Oh. I mean, like, what do you think that will look like? What will? So, it, it looks like in the course of either in the course of the coaching session or afterwards, and that afterwards is usually an email. Um, so in the course of the session, role play is actually a very big thing in coaching, in, 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 the, in the coaching that I do. So uh, if you're having an issue with your husband and it's um, your husband is squashing your dreams and now is the time for you to find your dreams, we'll have a role play and I'll play your husband. And in the course of that role play, I'll pause it, I'll stop, and then as a coach, I'll react. I was and I'm coming from the, I was coming from the role of the husband, and then I get to coach you on what superpower, what part of yourself do you want to develop in the course of this conversation with your husband? So that person then brings a part of them that's maybe been absent or dormant into the conversation, and maybe it's more love and gratitude, or maybe it's more assertiveness and and, and challenging. Uh, so whatever. Uh, whatever the growth that the, the, the path of growth is for that type or for that person. Uh, and they can maybe articulate that to me at the beginning of the session or at the beginning of our coaching relationship. That's where there's a breakthrough in the moment where the person goes, Oh, wow. I'm like totally ready to have that conversation. Like what's taken me so long to get there. Or like you're developing this, this show came from out of such a spirit of play. And we were having that spirit of play inside of the coaching session. So it's experiential. Oh, yeah. You can oh, yeah. feel it. Yeah, because if it's up in the head, it. if it's just a list of tasks that you need to do between our, our sessions, right. what, why would you bother doing them this week as opposed to last week? Or, you know, it's like you either need, you need the structure, you need the accountability, but it has to, it, they have to grow from your big dream in life. If you think your big dream in life is just exercise, it, it ain't that. The coach has to ask, okay, what's the result? What, what, what would happen if you had the exercise? And what would happen if that happened? And what would happen? And sometimes it's like just looking for a, a sense of belonging in the world or being loved. And it's really not about the weight issue or, you know, it's, 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 right. it's, it's yeah. deeper stuff. And so that's, that's my job is to access that deeper stuff like a therapist would, but, not, but for the purpose of moving, helping that person reach their dream. Or dream. So. That sounds great. I mean, I think these are all, I do see a lot of people asking some very big questions inside um, and using various forms to do that. Um, and I think this is really, um, I just wish you a lot of luck. And I think it's, um, I think you're going to be great at it. And I, I certainly you. know that my time spent with you was, was really productive in so, yes. on so many levels. And I just want to thank you for coming on and, and sort of talking a little bit more about it and, 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 and the bigger issues at large. Um, yeah. And I hope that we can have you on again when we actually do this in front of, a, in front of an audience, Rob. And until then, yeah. um, I wish you well. And for everybody in the audience, hey, I hope you'll be here again next Saturday at five o'clock when Patty Lupone is gonna be our guest. No, I'm, I'm really not kidding, she's gonna be here. And in the meantime, look for an email this week as for who our actual guest is really gonna be. And then don't forget to RSVP and tell your friends. And from everybody here at the IRC, thanks so much and be well, everyone. <laughs>